When I'm not reaping all the extra mental health benefits from not having a dislike counter at the bottom of this video, I like to answer questions and comments that I get on YouTube, so let's get to it. I totally enjoy your videos and most always get something out of them. I've been working on a song, saw your video about the key of E, and how the song is working much better in the key of E. Would you do a video on chord substitution secondary dominant chords and how to use them as always? Thank you. Secondary dominance. Secondary dominance is like the baseline of like when you actually really know your stuff. If somebody's having a, a thoughtful conversation about secondary dominance, you can't, you can no longer say that they suck in music theory or whatever. And it's actually really quite easy to talk about. So you have to know what a primary dominant is first. All this is gonna be in the key C, really easy. In any key, there's one chord that is the dominant chord, it's the five chord. So no matter what key you're in, if you just count to five, C, D, E, F, G, G7, G dominant seven, it's always gonna lead you back to the tonic or the one chord, right? So, so many songs, every time, whenever you see a G7, most likely you're gonna go to C afterwards, right? A secondary dominant is any dominant chord that leads you to another chord in the key that is not a C chord, all right? So, there's seven notes in the key of C. In any key, there's seven notes, diatonically speaking, with major scale, Western, Western music style. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. It's really easy to think about it in the key of C because there's no sharps or flats, all right? So, aside from C, there's six other notes. Those can become six other chords, right? If, uh, if you don't know these chords, check out the Patreon. I go into a lot more detail there, and I also have a, a video about secondary dominance practicing them that I just uploaded there. But the, the chords in the key of C are C major, D minor, E minor, F major, G major, A minor, B, diminished, and C, right? So if we're going to any one of those other six chords besides C, we can use a dominant chord to get there, okay? Now, in every case, we're gonna be introducing notes outside of the key to do this, because like I said, if we just use the notes in the key of C, G is the only chord that becomes a dominant seven chord, right? But any one of those other six chords, we can just go five notes away from their own scale and use a dominant chord, right? So a really cool exercise to do is to play a chord scale, just like that, a chord scale is where you just play the chords in a key, right? C, D, E minor, F, G, A minor, B, C. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. That's super great practice just to be able to do. That is essential practice, but the next step to really understand kind of how just how music works and how chord progressions work are to use these secondary dominants. So let's do the chord scale, but let's find every single chord's secondary dominant, okay? So what that means is if I'm going from a C major to a D minor, D minor is the next chord in the key. That's our target chord. Now once we have D minor, we can find out what its dominant would be, right? So we just start on D. D, E, F, G, A, okay? Now again, technically you want to use the notes from the D major scale, which would be D, E, F sharp, G sharp A, but eh, it just gets you to A, right? D, E, F, G, A, really easy short shortcut that you can do to always find the fifth of any chord, right? So A7 would be our dominant to lead us to D, so C, right? That sounds great, doesn't it? And A7 has a C sharp in it, which is not in the key, but that's why it works, because it's kind of sitting there, waiting for us to take the bait. It's pointing us at that D minor. Doesn't matter if it's a major chord or a minor chord, you can always use a dominant chord to get there. It's that root that is like the main thing. So let's do the other ones, and then by the time we get to the seventh chord, something interesting happens, all right? So we've got C. I want to go to D, D, E, F, G, A. A7 is my little bridge to get to D. What comes after D in that key? E, E, F, G, A, B. So B7 is gonna get me to that E minor, right? So C, A7, D minor. D, B7, E minor. Okay, what comes after E? F, F, G, A, B, C. So now C would be the dominant Secondary dominant that leads us to F. E minor, C7, F. 
How about G? G, A, B, C, D. So F. G, 7, G. Now after G comes A minor. A, B, C, D, E. G, E, 7, A minor. Okay, then after that we go to B. Now the interesting thing about B, or the seventh degree in any key, right? C, D, E, F, G, A, B. That seventh degree, it doesn't have a perfect fifth as its interval, right? Every other dominant chord we've used, the root note of that has been in this key. B is the first one if we just use B's mode, or just the notes in the key of C starting on a B. B, C, D, E, F. It, it has a flat five in it, right? But as far as the uh, secondary dominant goes, the fifth of B would be F sharp. Okay, so this is the first time where the root note isn't gonna be the secondary dominant of uh, the target we're going to, right? So F sharp seven would look like this. And that's interesting, right? We've got uh, an F sharp seven. Very interesting because there's no perfect fifth to kind of resolve to that B to. It just kind of has like a cool vibe, right? So a great way to practice that would be to just play chord scales with the secondary dominance. Start off with the G7. And now we're going to C. C. A7, D minor. D minor. B7, E minor. E minor. C7, F, F, D7, G, G, E7, A minor, A minor, F7, B. So that's a great way to just visualize how these work because again, Super important practice to be able to see the relationship between a root note in a key and its fifth, and then just bringing in all these chords. And now, now that these chords are in play, just in your mind, you can use them as cool substitutions and make more interesting chord progressions that kind of go outside of a key when we're really kind of staying in this key the entire time. You have Paul Rudd, Neil Patrick Harris vibes. Did someone just compare me to the sexiest man alive? I'm coming for your crown, Paul Rudd. All I need to do is get on that Hallmark Holiday Channel thing. People still keep blasting them on Instagram to make it, make it happen for your boy. Again, for those who don't know, I'm aspiring to be the douchebag boyfriend who gets dumped at the end of a Hallmark Christmas movie. Small role, don't want to be an actor, just want that to be happened so I can put it on my tombstone. Thank you very much. Try playing a guitar with a beveled arm and rib rest. It's like going from a bench seat to a bucket seat. Ah, the ultimate <laughs> discomfort of a bench seat to the pure luxury of a bucket seat. I do agree though. So like this is the Taylor 614 and it has the beveled armrest. So good. It just feel it just feels so right. I just want to get just want to get up close and personal with it. Fantastic feature right there. Say you only have $1,200, are you going with the Gibson G45 or the Made in Mexico Fender Acoustasonic? Now that is a very interesting question. So here's the Made in Mexico Acoustasonic, and this is the American Made Gibson G45 with the player's port on the side. Two guitars that are an identical price, but very, very different guitars. That's a tough question for, for me to answer for somebody else, because it just depends on what your needs are. This is an excellent full body sounding acoustic guitar. It does not have electronics. This is a totally different beast. And if I just had to pick one, I would definitely pick the Made in Mexico Acoustasonic. I think this guitar is a fantastic tool. Uh, I cannot tell a striking difference between this and the American made ones. Uh, there are some differences as far as like the nine volt battery compared to the USB charging, etc. cetera. But uh, the acoustic tone that comes out of this through a PA direct in is so convincing that it's as good as uh, anything else that I've you've ever even played. My favorite guitar to play live uh, for the shows, as you, maybe you've seen, is probably the, the Taylor 816. Uh, but sonically, it's again, there's the, the Fishman system here is, is so convincing. Like I can't really tell a difference sonically after the fact, if I wasn't 
just like being cognizant of what it was I was actually playing, right? <clears throat> so the fact that this sounds so good, it's so light, like when you have it strapped and standing up, it's such a it's such a more enjoyable experience when you're playing like a three or four hour set. And then if you do any kind of like live looping, uh, having the electric pickups and kind of like the lo-fi crunch setting on this is awesome. But it does bring an interesting question that I also want to talk about, and that is the battle of the gig bags. All right, so ever since I basically hit the lottery and have just been chosen by the gods to just try out all these guitars so people can see them, I've become somewhat of a connoisseur with gig bags. So I want to talk about three of the newer gig bags real quick and give my, my 60 second impression. So this is the Martin one that comes with the Street Master. This is an awesome, awesome gig bag. Uh, it's gorgeous, very comfortable, probably the most comfortable one, versus the Acoustasonic Fender gig bag, which has a fatal flaw, but would be the best one, versus the gig bag that comes with the Gibson G45 or the Generation Series ones, all right? So, the Martin one is the most comfortable, the Gibson one is the best. Why is it the best? Because there are pockets everywhere. The main pocket here has a headrest pocket also. Uh, the straps are in the perfect place and even another back pocket. So I can fit actually everything else I would need for a gig aside from the PA in the pockets of the Gibson. Whereas I've done it with the Martin and I actually have to carry a backpack along with it. The Fender Acoustasonic gig bag, man, I... This would be best in class, except this is the fatal flaw. In fact, take a look at where the shoulder straps end on every one of them. They end up in the neck somewhere. They don't end at like where the guitar juts out, where the body juts out. See, the Fender one ends right here, like the, the width, and you can't adjust this at all. So when you have the Fender gig bag strapped, it's like a good like foot and a half above you. So if you're tall, like, uh, like I'm like, whatever, a little over six feet. Uh, and uh, I like now I'm like an eight foot target and I'm hitting it into like, <laughs> into door frames and stuff. So shout out to all these companies for their gig bags. Gig bag game is definitely skyrocketing right now, but uh, I really got to hand it to Gibson. Best gig bag in the game that I've seen so far, but I'm open to suggestions. I don't gig, but I know how much of a pain those cables can be when you have so many and they start tangling up. You're right, best feature. So this comment was actually about the gig bag that I use where I kind of have all the cables separated, which has been a huge improvement in my gigging life, just having those compartments. But the studio is still pretty bad with cables everywhere. So uh, Hosa sent me some stuff. Uh, I think a lot of this is cable management. I don't really know actually what's in this box, but I just figured we'd open it up together. Little unboxing, unboxing video we got just in the, in the middle of the QA. Because why not, right? The good people at Hosa. Again, basically all my cables come from Hosa. The Hosa Edge stuff is like fantastic. Uh, and even like their cheaper stuff is like really awesome too. Also notice how, uh, how deftly I just opened that box and closed the knife when I was done. If you guys have watched any of the unboxings recently, you know that Drea is like the queen of just all that stuff. Ah, oh, so here's what we got. We got some guitar cables, the Hosa Edge stuff, and some XLR cables. I need these so badly because I've been kind of taking like my, my studio cables and then throwing them in the gig bag for the busking sessions and then hooking them back up to the studio. So it's awesome that I can actually just keep these in the studio the entire time. So we got that. We have, we have this. Don't know what this is, but it says Hosa on it. So I'm assuming it's some kind of cool bag, right? Oh, nice. Okay, so these are perfect. So basically you can actually take all your cables and then if you have like a run of like four or something of them, you just wrap them in the middle here and then you Velcro around so they all kind of fit through in the center. So eventually you just have one thing that looks like this as compared to a million cables sprawled all over the place. So these are, these are pretty cool to have. I've actually never had one of these. Same with these, this, it's the same idea, but it's braided. So cable management, definitely, definitely key. What is this? Ooh, a desktop microphone boom arm. So if you've never seen these, uh, the first time that we've used these was over at Drea's place when we set up her studio. Uh, basically just a microphone that you can clamp to your actual desk and then move it around. 
which uh, a lot of people have very limited space. So uh, for her specifically, that has been a game changer because having to move like a, a stand around all over the place is very, very monotonous, right? Get a smaller bag right here. Let's see what we got. Okay, okay. Love these because my Audix one broke. So just a mic clip. Always good to have backup mic clips. I, full disclosure, I keep these actually on the stands that I gig with, and then I throw them into the car, and uh, that's how I broke a couple of them. So thank you for giving me a separate one of those. Now this is really cool because this is a mic stand adapter. So a lot of different things will have just like the threading that you use for microphones, but today's day and age, video gear is also king too. So you can adapt a regular microphone stand to actually hold like a camera. So that's pretty cool. And speaking of stands, this is just a desktop microphone stand. Oh my God, perfect. These little things, these little things right here are awesome. Just to like have your phone set up on or whatever if you have like one of those little phone things stands are stands are a must smaller stands are an absolute must i'm always kind of scrambling with my stupid joby gorilla pod thing that just sucks and is no good in any way and then it looks like we have one more empty box which is filler so thank you hosa they've been a huge supporter of this channel they, they've outfitted me with all my cables and uh if you guys are looking for cables or any of that stuff definitely check it out well, in embarrassment, Sean Daniels' amateur singing sounds like nails on a chalkboard. Most uncomfortable video I've ever watched. He needs to stick to his so-so guitar playing, please, never again. Man, if I was worried about being embarrassed, there would definitely be no channels on this entire video. So thank you again for uh, for your viewership, and I will keep those those golden, velvety pipes rolling. So for listening homework, since we are approaching the holiday season, I can think of no better time than to throw you to my lo-fi Christmas album that I've been working on for the last couple years, adding to it every single year. So I think that I think that project turned out pretty great, even though very few people have listened to it. <laughs> but uh, definitely check that out. And then if you have any questions or comments, hit me up in the comment section, Instagram, Twitter, or the website, and I'll talk to y'all soon. Thanks a lot.